This is a production of Cornell University. All right, that is a, an introduction that I'm certain to screw up. So th thank you for this. Regression to the mean suggests that I'm going to have a miserable talk after such a wonderful introduction. And we'll see if I can uh, keep this computer doing what it's supposed to do. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Like uh, as uh, Victor said, I come to Cornell about every other year, but it's always a different department. And what I love about the sociology department is it's like seeing the reference sections to all of my books and papers come to life. Like, oh, there's Richard, there's Victor, there's David Strand. This is fantastic. So it's, it's great to be among uh, elite people like this. And, and I'll try not to bring you down too much. Um, so I feel like sociology as a field is good at making predictions, but usually about the past. So sociology is really good at predicting the French Revolution, um, like Jack Goldstone. Uh, it doesn't usually hazard guesses about the future. I understand that Richard has now uh, made a prediction about the coming collapse of the euro, um, which is exciting. So I'm going to join in this dark. Uh, prediction by describing what I claim to be something that might happen in the future, the coming collapse of the American corporation, which is outrageous and obviously false on the face of it. And I'm hoping in 90 minutes you'll say, ah, everybody knew that was coming. That's totally common sense. So see if we can shift things in that way. What I like to describe it is how do we get from here? This is Eastman Kodak, which if you live in uh, upstate New York area, as you may, kind of a familiar icon. It was an over century old corporation. This was the high tech economy in 1890. Eastman Kodak was the apple of its time. And it lasted for over a century until it was, uh, went bankrupt in 2012. And most of it will be liquidated. It might turn into a patent troll in the future. But it was a major corporation, a major philanthropist, a big employer, a sponsor of good works all over Rochester. It was, it was what we think of as a major corporation. So how do we get from here to here? And those of you between the ages of 23 and 35 will recognize this as the flip cam. Flip cam was awesome. Plugs into your, see if this works, plugs into your USB drive to power up. It's got on and off button. And that's kind of it. You plug it in, you take videos, and then you upload them to your computer, you play with them, you post them to YouTube. Hugely popular product, invented in 2007, 2009, had the largest market share in the industry, bigger than Sony. Uh, they were sold to Cisco in 2011, they closed them because it didn't make sense to have a camera like this when everybody could do it with their phone. And what I'm arguing is this is, this is a synecdoche, as they say in New York, uh, of what's going on with the <laughs> uh, going on with the broader economy, from the world of corporations to the sort of world of pop-up businesses that last for a brief period, and where do we go next? And that's what I'm thinking about. Allegedly, on sabbatical now, so I'm supposed to be hanging out with makers and looking at CNC machines and stuff like that. Uh, but that's what I'm thinking about next: is what happens in a world that looks more like a flip cam and uh, and less like Kodak. So I, I want to start by going back to an era that only maybe Richard and I and uh, Victor can remember, uh, 1973. So this was really, the, I would argue, the high watermark of corporate capitalism in the United States. Uh, you young people remember this man as probably the greatest liberal president in American history. <laughs> in retrospect, if you go back and see what happened during Nixon's era, you'd say, why is Obama such a fascist Republican? I mean, this guy, EEOC got litigation authority. The EPA was created. OSHA was created. It was amazing what liberal things were done to rein in rapacious corporations. You look at his tax reforms. In retrospect, you say, oh my gosh, he says, the rich need to pay more. They can afford it. We need tax cuts for the poor. It's remarkable. If you read about him and didn't know anything else, you just think he was a raving communist. So I was kind of, I would argue, this is the point that we want to dock ourselves to, 1973. Uh, at that moment, when Nixon was president, a few giant corporations dominated the economy. This is the Dow Jones Index from 1973, the 30 blue chips. So you see Eastman Kodak there, and Westinghouse, and uh, Bethlehem Steel, companies like that. 
10% of the private labor force worked at a mere 25 firms. That's remarkable. 25 companies had 10% of the private workforce. What that meant was, if you're Richard Nixon and you want to change how companies uh, hire and promote women or minorities, pick the top 10, pick the top 25, and you've already gotten a big chunk of the labor force. And when those practices spread to their suppliers and competitors, you can change industry. So really concentrated employment. Uh, 90 white men each served on five or more corporate boards. And here's a list of them. You can take a picture of this and look them up. This is a list I calculated this a few years ago. And some stuff, when some stuff with Mark Mizrucki. These are the 90 white guys that consisted the major inner circle of the corporate elite. Turns out that Franklin Thomas is not white. So I have to correct this. 89 white guys and Franklin Thomas served on five or more corporate boards. Uh, they probably met at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California to conspire against the rest of us. There's Nixon, there's Reagan, there's Don Reagan, who is Reagan's what, Treasury Secretary. So this is what a gathering of powerful white guys look like. They're sitting at a picnic table plotting world domination, I guess. Probably hatched unspeakable conspiracies. You're all too young to remember ITT, but those of us with long memories remember the other September 11th, 1973, when the CIA and ITT conspired to, uh, to pitch out the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende and replace it with a military dictatorship. I'm going to tell you that companies today don't get to call the Secretary of State and demand coups, but whatever, that was a topic of Mark Bezrucki's talk. This was essentially the, the, the completion of a vision of a corporate-centered society. So the book that uh, 80 years ago laid out what a corporate-centered society would look like uh, was Burley and Mean's book, The Modern Corporation and Private Property. And they explained how do we get to this situation where a few dozen corporations were so big, so powerful, so all-encompassing. So the factory system brought an increasingly large number of workers directly under a single management. So employment was very concentrated. Then the modern corporation, equally revolutionary in its effect, placed the wealth of innumerable individuals under the same central control. So that's what they're describing as the creation of a corporate society. All the assets and employees were in a handful of big corporations, uh, and they were controlled by professional managers. So I want to clarify things. For those of you that don't hang around in business schools very much, I want to be clear what a corporation is, because corporate now is an epithet. You say corporate when you want to insult something. So, oh, that, uh, that uh, Gangnam style is so corporate, you're saying a bad thing. You know, it's made to sell records. So I want to be really clear what a corporation is and what it ain't. So this is your law school segment to this. So a corporation, contractual device with limited liability, legal personality, and unlimited lifespan. That's basically the main legal definition. Public corporation, which is what I'm talking about today, is companies who have shares traded on a stock market. So it's something that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or whatever. So that's it. That's a public corporation. Uh, so to be clear, things that are not synonyms for corporation or corporate, although we often make this mistake, organization. Organization is not the same thing as a corporation. Lots of corporations aren't organizations. They're just legal devices that you use to hide your intellectual property so that you don't pay taxes in the US. Uh, business, business and corporate, not the same thing. Market, market is also different from corporate and finance. So what I wanna claim here is that corporation means something very specific, a structure that's used to raise capital uh, and to organize business, and it's not the same as every other thing that we might conflate there. So some premises of the corporate-centered society, if you go back to Burley and Mean's book, which I recommend to everyone, even though it was written in 1932 and nobody reads books anymore, they really had this vision for what a corporate-centered society was going to look like. And so some premises of the corporate-centered society. The first one, uh, unambiguously, is that typical corporations actually make stuff. Corporations are in the business of doing stuff, tangible, visible stuff. When they were examining the 200 largest American corporations, they were all transportation companies or manufacturers and a few other, and AT&T. 
but typically what they do is make stuff. Second is corporate ownership is broadly dispersed, uh, that shares are widely spread, that nobody owns very much in a chunk. So the third one is that corporate control is concentrated. That is that the people in charge are a concentrated set that overlap. The fourth thing is that corporations aim to grow bigger in assets and number of employees. The number one job of companies is to just get bigger. And the fifth is that corporations live for a long time. And that one is also implicit. They don't matter that much if they're insta-corporations. All right, so the first one is that the typical corporation makes tangible products. Um, that seemed pretty uh, unambiguous. So one of the interesting things that's happened in the recent past is that manufacturing employment has become increasingly rare in the U.S. So you look over here, this dark blue line is a proportion of the private labor force engaged in manufacturing. What you see is basically a blip during World War II and a continuous downward decline. Slight upturn for the last two years, but it's going to go away. This, on the other hand, is retail. Everybody works in retail. That's something that never seems to go away. So since January 2001, the U.S. has lost 5 million manufacturing jobs, or about one in three. That's kind of an apocalyptic number if you think about it. As of March 2009, more Americans were unemployed than employed in manufacturing. So when you try to think about what does a typical job look like, don't think about that Charlie Chaplin character working on the assembly line. So occupation, nobody actually works making stuff in the US. It's like there are farmers, but you're never going to meet one. Same thing with manufacturing. This had some important implications because the largest American employers have shifted from manufacturing to retail and other services. So this is kind of a stark thing. So in 1960, the biggest employers were a bunch of household names like Dow Jones Industrials, GM, AT&T, Ford, GE, U.S. Steel, Sears, and so on. 20 years later, basically all of the same companies. They were long-lived, large-scale employers with internal mobility. 2010, all services in nine of the top 12 are retailers. So the biggest employers are overwhelmingly in retail and not manufacturing. So as of now, Walmart employs about as many Americans as the 20 largest manufacturers combined. It's a really big number. The typical job today is a Walmart job. And I am a neutral social scientist, so everything I say I want you to recognize is value-free. There are no value judgments. When I say terrible wages, that is not a value judgment. That's meant to be just a purely factual statement, okay? So let's assume that everything I say is just factual and judgment-free, because I'm a social scientist. So comparison of GM and Walmart, uh, the median hourly wage in motor vehicle manufacturing, $28 an hour. The average person working there had been there for eight years. People spent their careers at General Motors. Uh, median hourly wage in general merchandise stores is $11.36 an hour. It's a little bit less uh, at Walmart. Median tenure with their current employer in retail trade is three years. Apparently, Nelson Lichtenstein claims that at Walmart, the turnover is 60% a year, which mathematically, if anybody's from the ILR school, like Pam Tolbert, 1.4 million U.S. employees and 60% annual turnover. That's just, that is, that is hard to conceive, but apparently that is actually the case. They never fire anybody. If they want you, because if you fire someone, you pay unemployment. They don't lay people off. If they want you to go away, they give you really, really bad hours. So midnight to 4 a.m., then noon to 6, and then five days off, and then midnight to 3. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, mean hourly uh, hours worked at Walmart, 34. So the average employee is, is a sort of part-time, sort of full-time person. Um, just for laughs, uh, up until recently, Walmart had a uh, optional employee health plan. It was very inexpensive, but it had a $3,000 deductible. And it turns out that if you calculate the average employee wage and average employee hours, that means it would take 10 weeks of full-time work to cover the deductible with your health insurance. So um, go Obamacare. Oh, wait. 
that was actually a value judgment. Sorry about that. So the second thing that, that uh, is a premise of the corporate society is that ownership is broadly dispersed. So there was a time when the owners of corporations were called widders and orphans. So when, uh, when corporate executives were talking about their shareholders, they'd talk about the widders and orphans that are waiting for their checks. And I just thought it was a weird turn of phrase, but it turns out that there was a source for this, for the humanists in the room. Uh, AT&T, at the turn of the 20th century, and for its you know, first 20 years of the 20th century, uh, people were really anxious that a company was that big and that powerful. There was a lot of populist fear about one organization being as powerful as AT&T. So they invented the institutional advertising campaign. The, the, the goal of an institutional advertising campaign isn't to get people to buy more of your stuff, it's to make them like you. Uh, to like your brand, to like your corporation. And AT&T did this for a number of years. So people were concerned that bankers in New York were controlling this monster corporation. They said, no, no, our shareholders are like widders and orphans. This is what our shareholder looks like. And they go through and describe that. My favorite picture of this is actually this one. This is a picture of our stockholders. So it's like this uh, array of Democrats. Here's the butcher over here and farmers and, and typists. And this is their stockholders, not a bunch of bankers in New York, but regular folks like you and me. Then up here, we got uh, this lady, the widow. She's opening up the dividend check. Presumably her husband was a lineman for AT&T and now she's collecting his, uh, uh, his uh, remaining dividend checks. And this is a kid saying, yay, candy. That was what the stockholders were supposed to look like. That was the goal of the institutional advertising campaign. So now time to dispel that notion. Uh, widows and orphans today, even you, you see that kid on the E-Trade ad, he's like on his phone and he's trading shares and stuff. I thought that was a documentary. Uh, it turns out it's not. Uh, nobody, even kids like that, buys shares on their phone. Nobody buys shares directly. People buy uh, mutual funds and exchange traded funds. So that's the way ETFs, you don't need to think about them too much. The typical corporation, 75% of its shares are owned by uh, institutions, not individuals. And it turns out that Fidelity, the, the mutual fund, is the largest shareholder of about one in 10 US corporations. So right here is where uh, the 401k started to become popular, all that money poured into Fidelity, and they became a very concentrated owner. All right, if you're gonna remember one thing today, which you probably won't, but if you were to remember one thing today, it is BlackRock, the most powerful unknown institution in the world today. So BlackRock is the largest shareholder of one in five US corporations currently. Um, okay, who can name the CEO of BlackRock without looking? Victor, really? Interesting. Isn't this interesting? We study power elites and sociologists and none of, them, none of us can name the person that runs a company that has $4.3 trillion in assets under management. That's a quarter of the American stock market. This one company that you've <laughs> never heard of owns and none of us can name the CEO. All right, the one thing you'll remember, Lawrence Fink. Um, he's the CEO, he's a Democrat and he went to UCLA. So on every dimension, he's just, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so who knows? The reason they're so big is that they bought the iShares business, the exchange traded funds from Barclays when Barclays was in trouble in 2009, and they keep getting bigger and bigger. They're basically controlling much of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because they're Democrats. And, um, so BlackRock owns 5% or more in over 1,800 US corporations. That's a really big number. They are the single largest shareholder of about one in five American companies, including Exxon, Chevron, Philips, Marathon, Apple, GE, AT&T, Verizon, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, and hundreds of others. So if you want to locate power in America today, if owning a corporation or being the biggest shareholder, if that were a source of power, I have now diagnosed it for you. It's BlackRock. They're really, really big. And this is like, so you should all be gasping at this. Gasp? Gasp. Thank you. 
Because holy smokes, how could they be the largest shareholder of the three biggest banks, the five biggest oil companies, Apple, GE? That's crazy. And how come I've never heard about this? So now you know. Okay. That's one thing I hope you remember. Uh, this is the second one I want you to remember. We, we uh, thought that corporate control was concentrated, that a few people that all knew each other were in charge and they met at the Bohemian Grove on a regular basis. So from the Pujo Commission to about 2001, corporate elites formed a well-connected old boys network by people serving on lots of boards of directors, people serving on five boards with a bunch of their pals. So this is the Fortune 1000. If we could actually blow this thing up, all these little schmutzes are the names of the companies. And if you blew it up the wall size, you'd see a thousand corporations in this big old ball. And what I love about drawing this picture was the first time I showed it to my wife, she said, wow, that's what, our, that's what our shower drain looked like back when you had hair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that's right. It's kind of a hairball where everybody's connected, coughed up by a cat somewhere with a handful of banks in the middle. Remember those three banks where BlackRock was the biggest shareholder? Here's where they all are in the middle of that hairball. J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Bank of America. And they're just connected by shared directors to everybody else. So if you're conspiracy minded, as everyone in sociology is, well, not the mechanisms people, but everybody else, um, this, make, this gives you some pause that they all seem to have that much power. This is the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase board in 2001, and it's color coded to make it impossible uh, to read. But so uh, Hans Becherer is on the board of, where does it go? Oh, Merck and... Honeywell International and Lloyd Wars on General Motors and you can see all of these people serving on all of these boards together. So if you were conspiracy minded, you'd look at this and say, wow, every American pharmaceutical company I can think of had a director at JP Morgan. What an interesting coincidence that was right before the Medicare D Act. But we're not conspiracy minded and we're not going to draw any crazy inferences. It is a coincidence that every major American pharmaceutical company had a director on J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I also like, this is one of my co-authors, Marina Whitman, and she was on like five of these boards. So I get to ask her, did you have really good gossip? And she said, no, nothing important happened. We didn't conspire against Allende, so stop your paranoid conspiracy mongering. That was the way the world looked right up until 2001. So interestingly enough, at that moment, if you thought about who was the inner circle, who were the most powerful people in corporate America, you'd think of that picture from the Bohemian Grove. You'd think of all of those white guys sitting around together conspiring. I mean, that was what the list looked like. So surprisingly, these were the five inner circle directors in 2001. I don't know if you can see that in the back. But demographically, they're not fitting the program. It looks really different from what people expected. It was much more, so four or five are African American, one is female, actually Shirley Ann Jackson. So if you asked a typical sociologist in 1973, what would you do to reform corporate America? They would say, the boards of directors are in control and we need to have more women, more people of color, and more academics. And in the person of Shirley Ann Jackson, you get a threefer. Uh, she is a physicist with an MIT PhD, president of Rensselaer Polytechnic. Score! Sociologists have won! You should have declared victory in 2001 and gone home. No, okay. So this is kind of a, this is a different expectation. So just at the moment where things start to look more equitable, then the business, uh, the business press starts calling them overworked directors. Instead of this being a sign of honor, it's a sign of stigma. Being on lots of boards means you can't be doing a very good job. And so they said about, th this is America's most overworked directors. What? Okay. So by 2011, there was only one person left. Remember we had the 90 white guys in 1974? Now we have one woman. She is the inner circle. The only person in America that still serves on five boards. So that's the second thing you should remember. BlackRock and collapse of the corporate elite. Fourth thing is, uh, the fourth premise of the corporate-centered society is the idea that corporations aim to grow bigger 
uh, in assets and numbers of employees. The whole reason that you are a corporation is to get as big as possible and to control as much stuff as possible. So it turns out that when more and more ownership was held by a handful of these institutional investors like mutual funds and ETFs, they don't sit quietly on the side. They pressure companies to do stuff. And one of the things that they've pressured companies to do is to increase their shareholder value. So if you looked at any corporate mission statement from the late 1990s, they were all written by the same computer program. Every company said the same thing. Sara Lee, they used to make Wonder Bras and Coach and Ballpark Franks and all these different products. But their primary purpose is to create long-term stockholder value. So when companies claim that they exist for shareholder value, you can be pretty sure that they're going to be almost non-existent a few years later. Uh, this orientation towards share price induced massive restructurings to look more like Nike. So for the business people in the room, how do you increase return on assets? One way is to increase returns by having more profits. Another way is to reduce assets by having less stuff, by selling off your factories and contracting out to somebody else to do the actual work. So the CEO of Sara Lee said, look, when, when they were announcing this plan to sell off all their factories, Wall Street can wipe you out. They're the rule setters. They have their fads, but to a large extent, there's an evolution in how they judge companies. They've decided to give premiums to companies that harbor the most profits for the least assets. So if you want Wall Street to love you, don't make anything and don't employ people. Just be as small as possible and you'll get the best valuation. And that was their so-called deverticalization program. And I don't, so I don't know if any of you remember Sara Lee, but last year they finally gave up. They split the remainder of the company into two. The European version is called Dow Egbert Special Blenders and the American version is called Hillshire Farms. That's what's left of what was a Fortune 50 company. Turns out that everybody in America, every corporation that's traded on the stock market, wants to look like Nike. I have trademarked the phrase Nikeification. So I actually have a, uh, a subsidiary in Bermuda that collects the revenues for every use of the phrase Nikeification, so please keep using it. Nikeification meaning look like Nike. They design sneakers in Oregon. They hire Michael Jordan or whomever to say how great their product is, but all of the production is done elsewhere in East Asia. Hardly anybody actually works at Nike, it turns out. <laughs> they got a few people in Oregon, but for the most part, they're the middle of this nexus. So advanced stage of Nikeification. So corporations no longer necessarily looked like a fixed organization. My favorite example, because it's so vivid, is Vizio. Everybody knows Vizio television. So I was actually staying at the Statler, and fancy hotels all have Philips TVs, and medium hotels have LG, and the Motel 6, they always have a Vizio for some reason. So, so when you go to your meth dealer, you know, check it out next time. So Vizio is, is fantastic because uh, the guy that started the business, he was a Taiwanese businessman, grew up in, in Hawaii, and he went to Costco and said, why do these TVs cost $10,000? I know what all of the parts cost. I could make the same thing for half of that. He went to Costco and said, if I could give you the same product for half the price, would you sell it? They said, we'd try it out. Instant success, huge success for them. Because all of the parts are basically commodities. Anybody can buy the parts for a, a TV and make it. There's, there's nothing special behind it. That's why Sony can't make any money doing this. So Vizio now has the largest market share of LCD televisions in the US with 200 employees. So that's remarkable. They can be very big in revenues, but very small in employment. Uh, companies don't necessarily have a fixed identity. So a few years ago, dogs and cats were getting really sick with liver damage. And it turns out that it was because their pet food had melamine in it. Uh, and it was, as the headline says, 100 different brand names. So name the brand and get there. Yukonuba, Iams, Science Diet, Old Roy, store brands, fancy brands. Turns out all pet food that you buy is made in the same factory in Ontario from the same horse parts or whatever it is that they put into it. Problem was that the horse parts that they were using was, uh, uh, was filled with melamine, which looks like 
uh, chemically is similar to protein, so it looks good when you test it for protein content, but is also poisonous, sadly enough. So every brand of pet food is made in the same place. This is true of every band of blood thinner. All the product, it's very hard to find a product in the US that's actually made by the company whose name is on the label. So it's not just Nike, it's all kinds of different products. Uh, no fixed nationality. We used to think we knew what an American corporation was. So uh, you young people, you're probably gonna be recruiting at Accenture. If you're under, you're gonna recruit at Accenture, right? Maybe not. Okay, so they do IT consulting. They're, they used to be called Arthur Anderson Consulting, but for some reason they changed their name. Uh, when they went public in 2003, they incorporated in Bermuda, and there was a firestorm in Congress. They were asked, oh, you're unpatriotic. Why are you incorporating in Bermuda? What if Somali pirates board your vessel? You know, you're gonna call on the US Navy. And they said, look, we are not an American corporation. We have a Chicago headquarters, but we also have a Singapore headquarters, a Shanghai headquarters. We operate in 53 countries. We have no nationality. We're like tofu, adopting the flavors around it. All right, they didn't say that. That would have been a little weird. But what was hilarious was they reincorporated from Bermuda to Ireland a couple of years ago. The technology outsourcing and management consulting company doesn't expect any material changes in its operations, financial results, or tax treatment as a result of the change. So that's kind of a remarkable statement. If you were to switch from an American passport to a Pakistani passport, I can guarantee that your life experiences are gonna be really different. But for Accenture, changing from Bermuda to Ireland is like switching a polo shirt to a, uh, uh, to a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. It doesn't really have any particular, it's just a choice that they made that day, but it doesn't have any deeper meaning to it. Uh, finally, corporations don't necessarily have to have employees any longer. So you may remember the company Circuit City. If you still go to sad looking strip malls, you might see their leftover hideous architecture that's supposed to look like a giant plug or something. So you can still see these sad old Circuit Cities that are now pizza parlors and, and Goodwill stores or something. Um, you can buy a Vizio television on Circuit City. The company uh, which was featured in the book Good to Great is an exemplar of awesome management uh, was liquidated in uh, January 2009. Their 43,000 employees were all fired. Uh, but this company, Tiger Max on Long Island, bought the brand name, bought the logo and the website name and just transferred over the skin and so Circuit City, at that point, had zero employees. You could still buy all of the same stuff, but the organization basically contracted with an automated order fulfillment system, and nobody was there. So I have trademarked the phrase, hermit crab organization. You know, hermit crabs are the ones that move into other shells. So hermit crab organization, you just buy the brand name and then sell your stuff to it. So that's a little bit extreme, but it does suggest that corporations don't want to be big anymore. They want to be as small as possible. There's a lot more money in just being the Circuit City brand name than actually employing 43,000 people. So one of the results of this is that employment has gotten much less concentrated. The biggest firms are no longer all that big, uh, at least in terms of employment. The fifth premise of the corporate society is a notion that corporations last a long time. The only reason we care about corporations is because they're big and they last a long time. They're like features of the landscape that you can take for granted. If that's no longer the case, then who cares? They're like a pickup basketball game. It isn't worth studying pickup basketball or pop-ups. So these were those dominant corporations and here's who's left. So by 2009, almost everybody was gone. So, so General Motors still sort of exists, although they're only one quarter of their size 20 years ago. Um, Sears still exists. I'm willing to make a prediction. This is not evaluative. They will not be there in three years, basically. That's, that's, my, that's, not, a, that's not intended as investment advice, just to be clear, but seriously, have you been to it? So, so you look at these things and you got, uh, Alcoa has actually now been kicked off the list as well. So Chevron, Exxon, GM, oil companies that have been around forever, uh, a GE, Procter & Gamble, United Technologies. 
big companies don't last. They're no longer features of the landscape the way that they used to be. Uh, the flip camera was intriguing as an example of a really successful business today. So it went from four years from being invented to being 20% uh, market share, bigger than Sony, selling all of those cameras, to disappearing. That, in a sense, is a successful business model today. Flip side of that is uh, Sony. So a few months ago, Sony's analysts said, look, just get rid of the electronics business. They lose money year after year after year trying to sell televisions and headphones and portable stereo, whatever it is that Sony makes and used to make them rich. They haven't made money on that in a decade. They keep losing money selling electronics. It turns out that their biggest source of profits is their life insurance subsidiary in Japan. That makes bank, but trying to make stuff doesn't make sense. So this morning they announced they're, spin they're selling the VIO business, their computers, and I think they're spinning out the TV business into a separate thing. So if Sony can't make money making electronics, you gotta worry about any other company. I mean, if, if big giant companies with overhead and corporate jets and, and lots of executives and stuff like that, if they can't make it go as corporations, something else is gonna happen. So I, I think this is a bit of a watershed. So, just to summarize here, I've been arguing that all of the things that we took for granted about the corporate society uh, don't really work anymore. Typical corporations don't make tangible products. Ownership isn't dispersed. Control isn't concentrated, at least in that corporate elite sense. Companies don't want to get bigger, at least not in uh, how many people work there. And corporations don't live a long time. So let's pause and take a breath here. Everything that we thought was true of the 20th century economy in the United States is no longer true. All of the major structures that have hold, held our society together have collapsed. Okay, if you're not going to start screaming, <laughs> uh, let me add to the, uh, to the trauma here. So you may remember that you, people used to talk about going public. There was this whole fad for selling shares to the public and IPO, and every university wanted to train their undergraduates to be entrepreneurs and do an IPO and, uh, or sell their business to Facebook. In retrospect, it's really clear that all of that was basically a 90s era fad. I mean, talking about going public is like talking about polyester pants. I mean, yeah, in the 70s that made a lot of sense, but we should stop talking about polyester pants. We still talk about IPOs, but nobody's actually doing them anymore, or at least not many people are doing them. One of the, the results of this is that the number of public corporations in the U.S. has dropped by over half since 1997. Every year but one is not just the dot-com bust. It's been a continuous downward slide with just one bubble-driven leap uh, in, the, in the 2000s. It keeps going down. So U.S. listed companies seem to be a bit of an endangered species. Uh, interestingly, the companies that are going public today, the Groupon, Zynga, Twitter, Facebook, Google, they exist, but they're not going to last. Okay, that's not meant evaluatively. That's just sort of a so one of the things that's supposed to make a corporation work is if the people, you sell shares to the public, if the people running the thing do a bad job, somebody else can buy it up and fix it. That's what a takeover is. You are wasting my money uh, by doing dopey things, spending money on jets or having birthday parties for your wife in Sardinia, like that guy uh, uh, Kozlowski from Tyco. Um, there ought to be a way to get rid of them, but the companies that have been going public in the last few years completely flout standards of corporate governance, like one chair, one vote. Um, so this is showing how many votes the founders get. So Mark Zuckerberg gets 10 votes per share. So one 28-year-old personally controls 60% of the votes at Facebook. That means nothing that anybody else says matters. If he doesn't like the board of directors, he can fire them all. If he wants to spend a billion dollars on Instagram without telling anybody, he can do that. None of us, no investors can do anything about it because he controls all the votes. That's also true at uh, Google, where the, three founder, well, the two founders and Eric Schmidt control 60% of the votes. Nobody can displace them. Uh, LinkedIn, 10 votes per share. Zillow, 10 votes per share. Zynga, they make these games that you don't remember them, but two years ago they were really popular with is it fruit something or 
Farm. I don't know, it's hard to remember, but they used to be a popular game company. The reason why they still exist is that the founders have 70 votes per share and nobody can get rid of them. And the best one is Groupon, which uh, you, you don't remember them, but it used to be a way for people to all buy coupons for stuff that then they never cashed in. So the three founders of this company, 150 votes per share. That is... So you couldn't do that in Hong Kong. Uh, Jack, Jack Ma, the, the guy that runs Alibaba, wanted to go public in Hong Kong. Uh, and he said, you know, and I'd really like to make sure that we maintain control of the board. And the Hong Kong Stock Exchange said, no, we're not going to allow that. Uh, you need to allow one vote per share. So he said, fine, I'll list in New York. So apparently you can get away with terrible things on the stock market in the U.S. that you could never pull off in China. That's a bit of a reversal, just to, to put it mildly. So from Facebook's IPO prospectus, if you're bored one day and you want dark comedy, oh, we shouldn't be videotaping this, should we? Oh, they don't recruit at my school. OK, that's OK. So Facebook's IPO prospectus is a, is a pretty remarkable document. One thing they tell you is one 28-year-old is going to control 60% of the votes of this company. So what that means is if Mark Zuckerberg got drunk and depressed, and the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund said, we'll give you $500 billion for Facebook and all of its private information and all of its photo identification and everything we'd gathered, he could say yes. And we couldn't do anything about it because he controls all of the votes. So that's one thing you'd learn from their, from their prospectus. Another thing is, why is Facebook going public? Why do they think it makes sense to sh sell shares to the public? Uh, there was a time when when companies went public, it was because they needed money to lay railroad tracks or buy stores or build factories. Facebook, something different. We do not currently have any specific uses of the net proceeds planned. Pending other uses, we intend to invest the proceeds to us in investment grade interest bearing securities or hold as cash. So they're selling shares to the public that they intend to put in a savings account. That should strike you as weird. Um, my research question there was, what? <laughs> like, why does it make sense to go public if you don't actually need the money? Well, obviously their rationale was they wanted to be able to pay off their venture capitalists and their early employees. So where does that leave us? So if you're young and entrepreneurial, as everyone attending universities today is supposed to be, uh, I want to give you guidance. If you have internet access right here and you want to flip open your laptop, you can actually implement this business plan right now if you have a credit card and a web connection. So this is a guide to a, uh, a, an instant startup business. And the product is iPhone Remote Drone Assassin. So the idea here is that using your iPhone, so people get very stressed out when they operate drones apparently. They actually have like post-traumatic stress disorder and so on. And they have to show up at a secure office to actually operate the things. People would be able to work from home. They wouldn't crowd the freeways. They'd be safer. They could watch their children while running the drones at home if we had the right iPhone app. So that is my proposed product, the iPhone Remote Drone Assassin. Target market is neo-mercenary firms like Blackwater or whatever they're called today. So that's the product. We're going to be Michael Dell here for a moment and come up with a dorm room business. So the first thing is you have to have a legitimate sounding address. Uh, as the institutional theorists tell us, if you say you're in Ithaca, they won't take you seriously because that's not a high-tech mecca. But if you claim you're in Silicon Valley, then you're surrounded by all these great ideas and venture capitalists. So you can actually rent an office at uh, plugandplaytechcenter.com. You can go there, rent an office, print up stationery, and they'll operate a mailbox for you so it'll look like you're a Silicon Valley company. You can incorporate online in Liberia for $713.50 American. So this is the actual liscr.com. Write that down. And you can actually go there and create a corporation in five minutes with a credit card. Awesome. Highly recommended especially if you are a tax criminal. You can crowdsource the funding at Kickstarter. Claim that it's your MFA thesis. You know, your Master of Fine Arts thesis is to make the craziest business possible. Please send me some money. I'll give you one of the drone assassins if you give me at least $1,000. So 
Jobs Act makes that much easier. You can hire the programmers for the app at Odesk. I don't know if you guys know Odesk, but it's like a really high-end version of Amazon MTurk. So you can get people that really know their Python. Uh, and what's great about Odesk, I actually saw the CEO give a talk about this at Harvard Business School, also known as the Death Star. Um, <laughs> So the CEO is describing the business and he says, you know, how do you know if the people you hire are actually working? Well, at Odesk, if you're going to be one of our contractors, you have to agree to install software on your computer that takes screenshots six times a minute. And so if you hire one of these people, you can see, are they watching porn or are they actually doing Python for you to make sure that your money is being well spent? So Odesk, awesome. You don't do the taxes. It's very easy to do from your dorm room. All right, so speaking of Jack Ma and Alibaba.com. <laughs> so this is a company that's going to go public in the U.S. The next thing you could do is find a Chinese drone vendor at Alibaba.com to hook up to your software. I don't know if any of you have been to this website, but it is awesome. Highly recommended that rather than wasting time on Facebook, go to Alibaba.com. It's unbelievable. Anything in the world that you want made, they can make it. Cheap, high quality. I, I thought I was joking about the sort of remote drone thing, um, but if you go, to, if you search on remote control, you would be shocked at how many different things are available in remote control at Alibaba.com. There's like bugs and all kinds of crazy things here. So that actually seems more plausible than you might have guessed. You can set up a payment system at Square. I bought one of these for my daughter for 10 bucks at the Starbucks. And you can just sort of zip your credit card through the little Square thing there on the right. It's a full service uh, uh, payment system. And you can get it shipped to the, from the dock to your customers with Shipwire. These guys will show up at Long Beach at the dock, unload those containerized shipping things, and bring it off to all of your different customers. So the story so far, if you add the whole schmear up here, is that the public corporation in the U.S. is now unnecessary for production, unsuited for stable employment and the provision of social welfare services like health insurance and retirement, and incapable of providing a reliable long-term return on investment. So that's the doom of the corporation part. That's kind of summarizing where we've been thus far. So now what? If the major structures that, uh, that have organized the economy fall apart, what can you do next? So this is the part that's a little bit more evaluative. I am actually in favor of democracy and a few things like that. So let me tell you some principles. First one is that the size and location of the institution should match the size of the project. So uh, Anthony Giddens at one point said, the modern nation state is too small to solve the big problems and too big to solve the small problems. Which I think is a wonderful quote that you should use as often as possible. Uh, form follows function. So where should the institutions be? Risk sharing things should be done at a very grand level. So income and health security, climate remediation, fixing New York after unexpected hurricanes, national defense, a big and centralized form makes sense. Uh, daily job, like life, uh, uh, jobs, production, small and local might make sense in that case. Second thing is that form should follow function. So formal organizations don't have to be the default. Formal organizations aren't the only way to get things done. There's a lot of ways to organize an economy. The third one is that this is a bit of a preference here, that the constraint of carbon emissions implies a preference for local wherever possible. It is kind of insane that I made uh, asparagus earlier this week from Peru and using bell peppers from Holland. That probably can't make sense in some important way. Last thing is that I think local control is preferable to central control, but lateral connections to the rest of the globe uh, turn out to be useful. So I got a couple of possible paths going forward that I think are plausible. So the first one, if we don't intervene, if we keep doing what we've been doing and don't pay attention, is the cyber, uh, cyber Fordism dystopia. So this is the global online assembly line brought to you by Amazon's MTurk. So the alternative is the utopian locavore wiki everything, where you're a genetic engineer in the morning, an urban fish farmer in the afternoon, and a mashup DJ in the evening. 
sounds crazy. This is an homage to a dead German political economist that I'm not going to mention because it's not polite anymore. But the notion that the cover charge is lowered so that people can do all kinds of things that they're interested in at various points of the day, I'm thinking we're actually closer to a point uh, where that is plausible. So one of the things behind this is that capital goods have become dramatically cheaper. So uh, Howard Aldrich spoke in this series a bit in the fall. He is buying a CNC router for $2,400 so that in his basement he can make all of his own furniture. And it's great. So CNC is computer numerically controlled. If you've never seen these things, go to a tech shop or go try out, go to a maker fair and see what CNC looks like. So in the 70s, when uh, computer numerically controlled machines were first coming out, commies and sociologists said, ah, oh, this is a nightmare. Imminent in capitalism is a tendency to make work more divided and more horrible and more brainless. So formerly skilled craftspersons are being reduced to mere sort of people minding machine while the computers do the work. And it sounded horrible. But the other end of that process is that anybody can learn to use CNC machine tools. If you can design it using <laughs> SketchUp or some software, on Autodesk software on your computer, you click print and the machines go broop, bookshelves, or broop, genetically engineered sheep, or I don't know what it's gonna be. So, so my 13-year-old uh, daughter and I took a class on laser cutters, CNC laser cutters, we downloaded some crap from the internet, played with the design, plugged it in, clicked print, threw some wood in there, and brrrr, it cut this thing out. It's amazing what CNC tools can do, and they're cheap as hell. A really high quality CNC router, router not like the Cisco things for computers, but things that cut wood, 20,000 bucks. So for half the cost of a year at Cornell, you could be a furniture, maybe a third of a cost, no, a third of a year. Um, you could be making your own much better than IKEA furniture out of rescued bowling alley wood. The designs are all available online. You can play with them, make your own furniture. So that's pretty different. The cover charge for being a maker is much lower than it used to be. Uh, 3D printing in the web enable the insta replication of physical objects. 3D printing is pretty overstated at this point, but laser printing was overstated in 1985, and then it completely changed the world. So for now, 3D printing is kind of a kind of fun thing, but not a key thing. But in five years, it's going to be remarkable. There's already beautiful 3D scanners. In fact, if you're a hacker, um, you know those Xbox Kinect things that like sense your movement? They turn out to be really well-designed 3D scanners. So I saw this guy like spin around, uh, take a vision of his head using a Kinect, plugged it into a computer, played with it, and printed out a perfect replica in 3D of his head. That's crazy. <laughs> so that opens up some really interesting new possibilities that we hadn't seen before, because it just becomes uh, cheap and plausible. The designs themselves can be shared and modified globally. So, you know, IKEA doesn't sell furniture, right? They sell you a bunch of parts and then a recipe for assembling furniture out of them. You could disintermediate IKEA entirely by downloading somebody else's beautiful bookshelf designs and then printing it yourself. And there's already this wealth of great designs out there that you can modify and play with and make all your This is a USB camera gimbal. I don't know what a gimbal is, but somebody thought it was cool enough to come up with the design and then post it on Thingiverse so the rest of us could download it and print out our own products. One possibility that could come out of this is if $150,000 is enough to buy a 3D uh, router, uh, lathe, 3D printer, the whole schmear, if you could get all of these things together, then every neighborhood could have a universal fabrication shop making all of the stuff that you can think of. Now there's sort of sprouts of this already going on. Um, 100kgarages.com, which is a wonderful website that you should all visit, you can find somebody in your neighborhood or in Syracuse and say, can you just make me some beautiful furniture, a little bit better than Ikea, here's what I can pay for it. And they'll do that or I have an idea for a product. Can you fabricate this thing? There's makers out there dispersed all over the country that do this stuff. So it's sort of like um, a network federation alternative to Alibaba.com. 
So that's interesting. That raises some post-corporate alternatives that might look a bit more, uh, a bit more locavore. So I'm very partial to the maker movement. Uh, people under 30, for the most part, who are totally burned out. And eh, it's hard to tell. <laughs> um, people under 30 who are burned out on post-industrial work and sort of the lameness where the, you spend your hours working and all you get at the end of the day is a PowerPoint presentation. That's not very satisfying. But when you make furniture, that's pretty great. So there's a whole movement of people who are hacking the craziest things and coming up with all kinds of fun stuff. And it's coming up in interesting places like Detroit. So this is uh, the tech shop, our local tech shop. What do you want to make with a CNC milling machine? In two hours, you can learn to use this thing, plug it into your computer, and make metal parts to replace the ones on your Bugatti or whatever it is that you drive. Uh, well, I guess that would be a car that Victor would drive, <laughs> most likely. It's turning up in surprising industries. So the basic Wikipedia idea, let's all share our ideas online, make them in a format that the rest of us can modify. It's happening in biotechnology as well. There are people posting bio bricks that are little chunks of DNA you can use so that you can genetically engineer your own hideous monsters that will destroy civilization. Should also be a great MFA project, by the way. Weirdly enough, uh, even the military is now crowdsourcing designs. It seemed like such a good idea for Wikipedia that they're now trying to take uh, mobile landing crafts and get them designed by people out there in the world rather than relying on military contractors. So to go along with all of this, this is the physical technology, the expensive stuff that you need uh, to make stuff. But there's also an organizational or social technology that goes along with it as well. So one of the surprising things is that forms that seem to have been dormant for a while have been sprouting back up. Cleveland, of all places, is heaven on earth for cooperatives. So I have to say that because in Detroit we like to say Cleveland is like Detroit without the glamour. So we don't like to give them a lot of props. But Cleveland has got this amazing co-op movement going on, the evergreen co-ops. Worker ownership is plausible. If, if the machines that you need to do a business are cheap, then you can organize as a co-op rather than going public. So it opens up new possibilities for local control uh, and organizational design that looks a bit more democratic. Turns out that the US has this long history, uh, this weird underground history of alternative organizational forms that people get surprised by. So producer co-ops, Land Lakes, the best and biggest butter in America, is a producer co-op owned by the farmers that actually make the the, uh, the butter. Ace Hardware, surprisingly enough, uh, is a co-op. It's a normal business until about 1973. The guy that founded it decided, I want to retire now, but I want the people that run the stores to own this thing. So he turned it into a co-op. So all of those local uh, Ace Hardware store owners are shareholders in the larger entity, and they elect the board and they customize things. It would be sort of a fun thought experiment to say, what would it look like if Walmart decided to go like Ace Hardware and became locally owned co-ops. Freakish, I know, but not impossible. There's certainly at least one precedent for it out there. Uh, consumer co-ops, REI is familiar to everybody. Credit unions, there's 90 million credit union members in the US. They don't fail the way that banks do in the financial crisis. They're all nonprofit organizations uh, by law. They have to be uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, and mutuals owned by their policyholders. So State Farm Insurance, a Fortune 50 company, is owned by, its, uh, uh, by the people that buy its products. And Vanguard, the mutual fund, is owned by the people that buy it. So Fidelity is a private business, but Vanguard is owned by Vanguard investors. So their incentives are aligned with the people that are actually investing with them. So it's not just communists and hippies. Uh, that have these non-corporate forms. It's also Vanguard, State Farm, uh, Ace Hardware, Land Lakes. There's a lot of non-corporate forms out there uh, that are possibilities. Most recently, there have been changes in the law that enable new forms that don't look like for-profit corporations. So the certified B Corporation is one way to do this. Um, and in fact, the business school regularly has classes offered by Fred Keller, uh, who owns Cascade Engineering. They were the first 
manufacturing company to be a certified B Corporation. So they write into their articles of incorporation, we don't exist just for profit, we also want to serve these other ends. This stuff used to be only hippies, now every state is passing benefit corporation laws, enabling companies to explicitly declare, we don't exist just for shareholder value, we exist to make children obese, hyperactive, and toothless. That could be written into the charter of your soda company uh, if you wanted to. Uh, one of the interesting things, so you know something's gone wrong when on Silicon Valley, uh, the big new wave is sharing. Because sharing is not a Silicon Valley. I live there, I can tell you. They're not good at sharing. Uh, they're not at all. Yet the notion of sharing apps is really hot. <laughs> The notion that you can make money by coming up with couchsurfing.org or airbnb.com uh, or car sharing services, that is an interesting trend. It's suggesting that people are willing to rent rather than own, lowering the costs of entry. So the bakers that I know, who are an interesting crew, they say, why would anybody in the world buy their own lawnmower? Why don't we just buy one really good Swedish lawnmower that's really well made and somebody will write an app so that you know when you get to use the lawnmower next. Wouldn't that make more sense? Bad for GDP because you're manufacturing less stuff, but good for the planet because you're manufacturing less stuff. If people are willing to do this, if that becomes a live option on the table, then it opens up interesting organizational possibilities for us. And this is where I end, because uh, you got to end somewhere. <laughs> All right. Open source institutional design for economic democracy. So this sounds hippie-ish, but imagine if sociologists ever actually wanted to say something useful rather than just critique stuff and talk about how awful it is. They might think about something like this. It worked for encyclopedias. It worked for the code running on computers all over the world. Why not for institutional designs? Why don't we think about ways to match the social technology to enable new forms to all of the real technology in the web that make that possible? So that's what I'm thinking about next. I know this sounds a little bit weird, uh, but that's, uh, it would be interesting if social scientists said, all right, kiss the corporation goodbye. What do we come up with next? How do we seize the reins of history to come up with designs that make the most of this technology to give us that utopian future and not the dystopian one uh, that I mentioned in passing? Okay, well, I think we're running out of problems with the computer, so I guess it's time for, uh, for questions or to run away screaming. Your choice. Thanks. <laughs> All right, prego. Um, so I, I really love uh, your vision, your utopic vision uh, of where we could be going at the end. But yeah. I want to uh, press more on the obstacles, uh, <laughs> obstacles that seem to be barring us from mm. that, that dream and maybe pushing us more towards the dystopian okay. uh, view and ask how you might account for those obstacles yeah. uh, before we get to utopia. Yeah. Um, I, I recently read Greta Kuttner's book, Capitalizing yeah. the Crisis, she's a colleague of yours. Yeah, so, awesome. Um, great book. And yeah. she uh, argues that uh, it's about the rise of finance, financial relations, you know? Yeah. And she argues in that book, the thesis is that there's a capital scarcity problem in, in around 1973, like I want to work yeah. for the corporation, yeah. um, that has not been solved. It was solved sort of by accidentally stumbling into financialization, which is a lot for, I'm sure you know all this, for the styling of credit, um, and that this situation has not been remedied. There's still a situation mm. of capital scarcity that we're eventually going to have to face, mm. um, and that we should have had to face it, and it should have been very clear after 2008 that we need to face it now, but it seems that we're going back into the same regime of, of, of credit spiraling and uh, excessive financialization. Yeah. Um, at the same time, the, the changes of the corporate model and the rise of finance have also only exacerbated the questions of inequality. Yeah. Um, so thinking about how this utopic model is going to work for people who are don't have the capital to buy even a twenty thousand dollar machine to help them make, because mm. uh, that still is a pretty high bar for uh, a large per percentage of Americans. Yep. Um, so I'm just the question of inequality, the question of, of finance and capital scarcity. Uh, mm. how, how does this work with your vision of what's changing the corporation? Yeah. No. Great question, and I have a fifty-five minute answer. 
<laughs> but I'm going to give you the short version, uh, just because we got that, those drinks waiting for us at 6 o'clock. So, um, so capital scarcity, I'm not going to come up with a good answer for. I can't really see any future that doesn't involve some form of collapse. So sorry about that, uh, as we fake Canadians like to say. Uh, I mean, it's been built into the system in various ways. We keep revisiting the same crisis. My prediction about the next one is investors are going to say, wait, what were we thinking with that whole Twitter, Facebook, Zynga? These should not be organized as public corporations. This doesn't even make sense. Uh, they could rent, I mean, so this is interesting. I got a crazy case for you that I discovered last week. So Netflix, so you remember Blockbuster? They also used to be smirched next door to the, the Circuit Cities. They were the other empty store all over. So 10 years ago, they had 9,000 stores and 83,400 employees. They were a really big company. Twitter, which is their functional replacement, has 2,000 employees, and they don't even own the servers that they stream from. Apparently, they rent the capacity from Amazon, <laughs> which has become the utility company for cloud services. So it doesn't cost that much, necessarily, to be Twitter. So on the one hand, that lowers the, uh, the, the on-ramp. That means the possibilities for starting a business are a lot smaller. So it's true that $20,000 can be a lot of money for somebody, but if you have a tech shop in your neighborhood, Membership is $100 a month. And for $100, you get access to all of this equipment and all of the computers. You could imagine public libraries deciding, have discovered that no one under 30 ever visits a library for books. They might for other reasons, but they're never there for the books. There's lots of shelves full of books that your generation doesn't read. <laughs> and doctoral students certainly don't read. Sorry, but it's just true. Uh, they don't read journals physically either. So. So in that situation, you could say, well, we've already got a municipal precedent for having one big place that has a lot of resources gathered. Most libraries already have a whole bunch of, they have DVD rentals or DVD lens and they have computers. Why not make a floor of the library be maker space? Uh, you could imagine having a half mil tax. That would be enough to buy all the equipment you need to have it available so that if you're a clever entrepreneur and you design some really interesting thing, you could probably gain access to that stuff there. So that would be one way of making uh, that accessible even to people without many resources themselves. Is it gonna solve the capital problem? That one is uh, that's beyond my pay grade. That's, so if I really wanted to lay out all of the things that have gone wrong, a um, couple more crises to worry about. One is that everyone under 30 owes a ton of college debt, especially if they went to Cornell. Oh my God. Yeah, college is really expensive. Faculty like me keep expecting raises every year, but we never get more productive. I still talk at the same speed to a room with 70 people, and yet I keep expecting to get paid more, which makes no sense. Uh, and so we have to keep charging you more for that. That's kind of a problem. So there's a trillion dollars in college loan debt out there, and I can't see a way it'll ever get paid back. So the generation entering the labor market is basically in peonage. <laughs> uh, you can't dismiss it if you go bankrupt. Uh, the baby movers are screwed because they didn't save enough for retirement. You know, Social Security is not going to be enough. The median household uh, investment, shareholding investment for their retirement is $23,000. You can't buy a used Pontiac for that much money, and yet that's what baby boomers on average have saved to retire. They're all gonna be hitting the wall in the next few years. So if we could take out those two generations, <laughs> I think 35 to 50, that is really the sweet spot. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's way more problems to, to solve than the ones that I described. I'm really hitting on how do we actually make stuff and address employment? And so for that one, I think I got a model for it. I mean, I think this is, you could imagine organizing things so that the normal person, if you're willing to share a lawnmower, uh, share a car, uh, use apps to find uh, hotel rooms for cheap or do you know, couch surfing, you can live on a lot less money. <laughs> so it's possible to imagine a future where people work 15 hours a week instead of 40. They've got plausible health care, <laughs> ideally. And, uh, and they just don't own as much stuff, but they have a rich and rewarding life because they have control of their time and they can read and think and visit the library again. 
So this is suggesting you got to solve a whole lot of problems all at the same time. Um, so this is my first one. <laughs> Wikipedia for organization design. Uh, saving the baby boomers and the, the uh, peonage college debt people from under 30. That'll be the next book. But thanks for the question. You made me depressed. <laughs> yes, please. Hey, David, how's it going? You're still here. Yeah, Are you okay? I'm amazed you're awake after that. You're an Iron Man. Yeah. 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 And you know, if you think of it as a legal vehicle, then that's not in trouble, though it is evolving and changing. And yeah. It's really the demise of the big manufacturer that it seems like you're talking about. Um, and so, so maybe that's it. There's a question of is that, is, is that fair? And, yeah. and the second thing, though, is, is I guess I get confused um, with the, uh, towards the end, uh, with the kind of euphoria of the new yeah. and so on, yeah. um, as to whose side you're on. Yeah. Because I thought we sort of started with the old manufacturer as a kind of source of community welfare and, mm. and perfect, good perfect citizenship potentially. Yeah. But, and we ended with with you know the um, the small scale utopia and, and kind of you know how could one push forward further? Yeah. The quick, quicker demise of the of the big manufacturers. So yeah. Yeah, no, those are good questions. So, so I, I skated past entirely that inequality question. Uh, and I've got a paper that I love that no one has ever read that I've written about inequality. So I've found the highest correlation in all of the social sciences between corporate size and greater equality. It turns out that the correlation between the relative size of the largest employers in an economy and inequality is negative 0.89, meaning that bigger firms lead to greater equality. And it's true around the world. Denmark has huge companies and low inequality. Colombia has tiny companies and high inequality. It turns out to be true around the world, but it's especially true in the US. When conglomerates got big in the 60s, inequality went way down. When conglomerates got busted up, inequality went way up. And it just changes almost in lockstep year to year. So counterintuitively, the bigger the corporations, the greater the equality. So sadly, that suggests that the future I'm sketching, pretty much no matter what you see as the future, unless we all end up working for Amazon as temps, is one where there's going to be more inequality. There's going to be hedge funds that employ three people and make a billion dollars per partner. And there's going to be grounds crews that employ three people and don't pay minimum wage and a range of things in the middle. I, I wish I had an awesome answer to that, but I can't see a way around it. You know, big employers really do seem to reduce inequality by, by imposing a psychological boundary around things. So the utopian thing, so I, I'm not actually, all of my relatives, all of my grandparents moved to Detroit to work in the car companies and like the family business was working at the Ford factory and those jobs sucked. <laughs> they, were they paid well but they were horrible mind numbing jobs and I don't wish we could go back to an era where people did that stuff or to the Braverman era. I like the one where I'm designing stuff with my 13 year old and we're printing it out in plastic and we've got Stephen Colbert coffee mugs and I mean, that's actually a pretty cool world. We're going to lose the benefits of the large corporations. This doesn't make sense as a system. I mean, there's good things about uh, the aristocracy, I, su I suppose, but we're not going to go back to it. So how can we make the most of the future? The reason I do it is because my pal Jerry Jacobs saw me give a talk and he said, why are you always so depressing? You know, it's really fun to always end morosely and talk about how everything's falling apart. Have you ever thought about saying something useful and hopeful? And I thought, no, I never have. But now that you mention it, I'm going to throw some utopian stuff in. So that's where that came from. Oh, all right, that's slightly facetious, but but large, you know, it's largely true. <laughs> well, so I think it's the opposite of commodification. So if you say there's designs available online for really awesome furniture, so much better than that horrible IKEA stuff. Sorry, Richard.
I know patriotically you're required. <laughs> no, but I mean, so what if you had those designs, but you can use them from rescued bowling alley wood from Detroit? That would be awesome. So that's like the opposite of commodification. That's saying I could have highly customized, and I use this example because I actually have a coffee bait table made from rescued bowling alley wood in Detroit, made by this guy who's a block away, this maker who does stuff. So you could actually have this really cool microculture going on that's much more local. And so, I mean, is Linux commodified? Is Wikipedia? I mean, you know, you use it as you see fit. The tools might become commodified, but the uses you put to them. Um, so I was trying to be more hopeful. Tell Jerry Jacobs if you see him. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so this is the common collapse of corporations everywhere. I mean, it seems like someone else is manufacturing it, this kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's going to be two parts to this. At the moment, all manufacturing is going to be done in Shenzhen because there's still very high economies of scale. Five years from now, all manufacturing will have returned to native countries. And so the U.S. is going to be making iPhones and the rest of that stuff isn't going to be made or assembled in Shenzhen. It's going to be made in the U.S. Partly through a combination of stuff as you can 3D print parts of it and assemble it. Uh, and robots get a lot better. So, but you don't, if the capital costs are very low for entering a business, then there's going to be room for a, in some industries like energy extraction. Oil companies are never going away. There's always going to be an Exxon. Uh, phone companies probably are never going away. Uh, entities where you need very high capital investment to make the thing run, and there's no way around it, either they're going to be owned by shareholders or owned by the state. So anything that the French government used to own, like car companies, steel companies, phone companies, oil companies, that's probably going to be either publicly owned uh, or traded as corporations. In the same way that uh, Denmark still has a royal family and Great Britain still has a royal family. There is still an aristocracy. They're just not the central thing the way that they used to be. So that's, that's kind of the prediction. Some industries, there will still be public corporations. The run-of-the-mill thing, like David was saying, is this only manufacturing? Uh, no. Um, there's no reason for, uh, for Netflix to be a public corporation because they can rent the capacity pretty easily. There's no reason. They don't, their capital expenses can be pretty low in a lot of different. Dropbox, there's no reason for them to be a public company. Oh. But basically, they'll be lean and mean, the corporations, the new corporations. They'll be small yeah. and they'll be mean, right? That's the general thing. And spin yeah. off this inequality. At a faster pace. So, so they could do, or it could be the utopian uh, future that I described, where it's all local co-ops and and uh, and uh, the peasants take over the Walmart and make it into a co-op. <laughs> but the American corporation uh, will uh, not create jobs like they did before. Yeah. And so you're predicting a jobless economy. Yeah, the, the jobs will, will still yeah. be there. The jobs will never come back, but there still may be an Amazon.com that's publicly traded. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm an economist, and I, oh, I do sorry. data. The, the, the size of the manufacturing is $1.6 trillion in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's about 10% mm. of, of GDP. Mm. Now, ask yourself. Mm. Um, is that much of what we care about mm. is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Professional services mm -hmm. is $1.7 trillion. Mm. That's not counting education. Mm -hmm. It got done by government. Mm. It's not counting health care, yeah. uh, which is 17% of the economy. Mm. Um, the, the spending on education is like 7%. Eight uh, percent yeah. of the economy, but that's not counting the time of the students. Mm. Okay, the students are unpaid workers mm. in the education enterprise. When Jorgensen and you know the economists who do this mm. try to come up with what really being produced, mm. education and healthcare is huge yeah. and much more important than man. Manufacturing is now, and yet the whole talk is on 
corporations, yeah. kind of, you know, which are really a lot of the corporations do other things. Yeah. Um, and certainly Cornell, yeah, it's non profit yeah. corporation, but it's an extremely big and powerful organization. Yeah. So I think you're uh, coming out of tradition where manufacturing mm. is everything. Mm. And it's not mm. anymore. And it's going to become less and less. And what's important is arts. And I mean, in terms of our standard of living, mm -hmm. it's things like arts and entertainment, education, healthcare. Mm -hmm. Things that, yes, they get helped by some pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. It's really a production of humans demonstrating or providing services to other people. And so that I think you're sort of missing where the world is the economy is going by the focusing on um, this manufacturing technique of, of uh, which they have down on, on, on uh, College Avenue. Yeah. It's a little place where they got a couple of those machines. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the examples you give are great ones. Well, notice that the title of the talk was The Coming Collapse of the Public Corporation. So. I think there's no falseness in advertising. That was the target of the thing, was a public corporation. There's a reason why hospitals mostly weren't public corporations, and universities weren't public corporations, and public and uh, professional service firms weren't public corporations. So the one you're describing as being important, they never were public corporations to begin with. So you wouldn't see the collapse there. Uh, some are. I mean, healthcare is the most mutant hybrid structure Yeah. or uh, limited partnerships and so forth doing stuff so we have other forms yeah I, it, we big thing that's happening is yeah. that manufacturing is shrinking and that's a good thing hmm. yeah so because it creates jobs for people who are really poor in, in Asia and they, they're getting a, a higher standard of living as a result yeah so that's going to go away in the next 10 years but no, but Americans have, don't have those jobs. It's some people who are happy to work for two bucks an hour. Yeah, so it's, uh, this is why I was really clear about what I mean by corporation and public corporation is LLCs are flourishing, LLPs are flourishing, alternative forms like co-ops are flourishing, most professional partnerships are LLCs or LLPs, not public corporations. So that's why I was really clear at the start. This is about the public corporation, the IPO, trading shares on the stock market. The thing is that those things that are not public corporations, they might be like, so Cornell University doesn't shell, sell shares to the public as far as I know. Uh, hospitals for the longest period was nonprofit, overwhelmingly nonprofit local organizations. Um, it's changed, who knows where it's gonna go in the future. Professional service firms, some of them go public, but mostly not. And that's why I didn't focus on them, is because they were never in that Berlian means world uh, to yeah, begin with. They're not. Berlian means is describing yeah. an environment where 30% of the workforce was in manufacturing yeah. uh, during World War II. Um, and now it's under 10. Um, and so it's we're a completely different society. Yeah. So if those institutions disappear on us, those things that we've lived with for a century, we need to rethink social structure because we're very dependent on a particular way of organizing things. If we can all work at hospitals, problem solved. But I'm, I'm skeptical. Well, uh, thank you so much for this uh, very amazing lecture. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for your patience with the technology. I'm, I'm like, I'm angry at Hewlett Packard for. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.